alchemy. I've wanted to ask you something all this time. The danger you were seeing around Kalos. What exactly was it? Green fire. A flickering green flame. I saw it engulf Kalos and threaten to consume all of the people and Pokémon in that swirling fire. You will all play a substantial role in the chaos and turmoil, and every one of the villains who tried to steal the sundial. Sigurd will purify the earth with green fire. Deep green eyes. What is this you're trying to tell me? As the journey continues, it all comes together. The e eclipse. <laughs> oh. <sighs> what? Hello? Loxton? Oh, hey, you're alive, man. You had me really worried there. What? What? Dude, I've been calling you for days. You passed out while laughing manically at the end of Pokemon. Oh, yeah. And actually, those of you watching should probably check out that last video before you watch this one. Otherwise, a lot of what we say might not make sense. What? Oh, sorry. I was just breaking the fourth wall. Oh. So, Logsden, you basically convinced me, but I remember you saying there was more. I don't know, Toby. I'm almost positive that I'm just overthinking a kid's game because of our desperate need for a more mature story in this vast and beautiful Pokemon world. Well, I mean, isn't that the best reason to reboot the series? I mean, all the people who grew up with the franchise when it started, they're having kids of their own now. And in fact, all the kids nowadays, they're just playing Call of Duty and Clash of Clans, so I guess your average Pokemon player is more on the age of, of, what, 16 minimum? Plus, look at Pokemon Go's booming popularity, especially with people who gave up on Pokemon generations ago. I think this is the perfect time, if not now, the 25th anniversary. True. True, and, and, and plus, do you really think that they could just keep going and going on forever until the number of Pokemon reaches the multi-thousands? Obviously not. Plus, plus I did a bit of thinking. When? Uh, in my sleep, I, I sleep think. Okay. What if that white spot in the, the middle of Zygarde is referring to another game? One after Sun and Moon, and I, I, and I mean one. So what, like a third game? Pokemon hasn't done one of those since Platinum back in 2008. Not necessarily a third game, but... Well, maybe. <laughs> oh no, please, please don't go crazy again. <laughs> don't worry, Toby, I won't. But you know, Game Freak has been going back and forth between new game and remake, and new game and remake, back and forth, back and forth. So the remake of the Gen 4 games, Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, will be next, obviously. People seem to be flaunting that around as if it's some sort of insider secret. I mean, a monkey could figure that out. Eh. But, well... What color is platinum? Well, it's a highly reflective whitish silver. And could you bring up a picture of the astrological symbol of the sun and moon, which are also the alchemical symbols for gold and silver? Okay, hang on one second. Let me get to my computer. I'll do the same. Get on Skype. Okay, done. Good, now put them together. Yeah. And that is the alchemic symbol for platinum. Damn it, Loxton, you can't keep this all up. This is crazy. <laughs>I was reading some of the comments in the last video that you somehow uploaded in your unconsciousness, and while mostly positive, a few people are calling the whole thing bullcrap because of- Let me stop you right there. You were going to mention that one or two points I made were a bit of a stretch, yeah? Will everything I say be concrete? Heck no. I'm making quite a few stretches and speculations, but even if a few points I made here and there get totally debunked in some future trailer, that doesn't mean the entire theory falls apart. Honestly, you have to be a pretty close-minded idiot to think that. I mean, unless it's like the very base and foundation of the theory, but it's it's like a game of Jenga. You can remove or disprove certain pieces, but you would have to constantly do that to a lot of them before the whole theory comes crashing down. And no, 
I only made a few stretches here and there, and most of them only provided minor evidence, but I feel like every bit of evidence is worthy of being brought up because it may develop into something greater in the minds of the masses. Or something much, much worse. Like, I remember one comment was saying that because I didn't mention the legendary Keldeo, then it can't all come together and I should kill myself. But I don't want to linger on the negative for too long, so let's get back in this. Sounds good. So obviously your major complaint was that you didn't touch upon Gen 4 or 5 enough. Now that, that is a valid concern. I mean, it can't all come together if I don't include every single generation at least. I did bring them up a tad, but not much for the sake of time. A 45 minute long YouTube video is already a bit too long. But it would take nearly three hours if I included everything. But really, even if this theory were true, do you really think that they've been planning this since the beginning? Well, obviously not. I mean, they do plan out a bit in advance, like how out of the first three generations of Pokemon, a lot were designed all at the same time and then divided up into three gens, and a lot of Pokemon were planned far in advance. Right. It could be only as recently as X and Y that they've been planning all this, or maybe as early as Generation 4. I feel like since Gen 4, they've had the broad idea of what they wanted to do in the future, but left all the details blank, and just filled in those as they went along. Or, also who's to say they didn't piece everything together by looking back at their previous works and being inspired by it. Like, uh, take this for example. In Pokemon the third movie, there's a book that is described as an artist's rendition of what some never-before-seen legendary Pokemon may look like. And in this one page, there is a sun legendary and a bunch of hibiscus flowers on an island on it. These flowers, of course, being the main flowers of Hawaii. But do you really think that as far back as 2003, they've been planning on having a game based in Hawaii with a sun legendary? Well, I mean, it's possible. True. Though improbable. But some companies do plan out things decades in advance. So now then I assume you're gonna blow my mind with some more alchemy and Hinduism and- First, Toby, let's cover some more Greek and alchemy stuff. Specifically, this time, things found in Gen 5. Black and white. But you should first know that Sun and Moon's development was known as Project Pokemon Rainbow. By the way, a rainbow has seven colors, and this is the seventh gen. Also, one of the first quotes about the game while it was in development was that the next Pokemon game will have a lot to do with flowers. I remember you mentioning that, and interestingly, most of the important characters in X and Y are named after flowers in one language or another. And even the new characters brought into Auras are as well. But are you saying it goes back even earlier? Exactly. Take Iris, for example, the champion in Black and White 2 and Ash's companion in the anime. She shares a name with a flower and the Greek goddess of rainbows. And said Greek goddess is also the messenger of the gods, is the, and she is the link between mortals and the gods, just like the Azoth and one particular translation of Tapu Koko. And oh so conveniently, the messenger goddess in Hawaiian mythology, Anue Nue, is also the maiden of rainbows. And remember, the Kalos legendaries are at least somewhat related to the Norse tree of life, and in Norse mythology, the rainbow bridge, or Bifrost, is what connects the gods and man. Pokemon Rainbow could easily be switched into Pokemon spiritually linking gods and men. Plus, when we reach Iris in the Pokemon League, she has this strange observatory behind her. Four planets circling around a huge sun. Firstly, the sun emits all of our light, the whole spectrum, every single color, kind of like a rainbow. And this sun seems to point at it representing the champion, which fits better here, as we know the sun also represents gold in alchemy. And being the champion means you get a gold medal. Yay. But the sun also represents heart. And Iris's description is that she can read the hearts of dragon Pokemon. And this sun here also fits the previous champion, Alder, as well, especially since he had a Volcanrona, the sun Pokemon. And plus, just look at him. Anyway, standing behind Iris is the symbol of the dragon. While this seems to be because she's a dragon trainer, there is a lot of emphasis about becoming one with dragons. And according to the Hermetic Cabinet, Alchemy and Mysticism by Alexander Rube, the dragon in alchemy is very interesting and fits with Iris. The alchemical dragon is a term used for philosophical quicksilver, separate from mercury, and is a vessel 
for the soul and is instrumental in reading the hearts of others. This fits beautifully with Iris and her connection to dragons. Not only that, but after losing, she talks about getting to know one another even better than before. To her, battling is about understanding your Pokémon and your opponents. And yes, this isn't the first time we've heard this said around the Pokémon world, but it's just more minor evidence that helps. Now, as for the four planets around the sun, they have the colors and symbols matching the four types that the Elite Four here are. Dark, Fighting, Psychic, and Ghost. At first, this seems to be it. Cool, awesome symbolism, it all comes together, but no! It goes deeper. Knowing that the seven alchemical planets are extremely important in alchemy, I figured maybe, just maybe, the symbolic meaning of these planets in alchemy line up with the Elite Four. And remember, the seven planets of alchemy include the sun and the moon, so scratch those, and we're left with five planets. And wouldn't you know it, four of them fit perfectly. So we have Dark, Fighting, Psychic, and Ghost. First, let's look at Saturn. Saturn governs the metal Lead, which is a primary symbol for Dark Prime Matter. Saturn and Lead have nefarious overtones as they play an important role in the more sinister alchemical processes. The word nefarious and sinister work here perfectly, as the Dark type in Japan, or its origin, is actually the evil type. <laughs> I was gonna say, dark isn't really the darkness as much as it is cruel and sinister. Next we have Mars, the governor of iron. It's also the planet of masculinity, physical strength, high temper, primal urges, war. Fighting type fits here perfectly. Now Jupiter. Jupiter represents higher, finer frequencies and planes of thought. The use of your higher, more refined plane of mind. Psychic. And Mercury elusiveness, creative flexibility, the bond between our physical bodies and spirits. Mercury represents swiftness as it can phase through and perfectly around other objects. Ghost. It's marvelous, Toby. Simply marvelous. Even with leaving out Venus, the rest of this all fits into place so well it can't be a coincidence. But out of curiosity, can Venus fit into it at all? Kind of, yes, it's tricky, it's a bit of a stretch, so I'd say for now, just assume, not really. At least not into this room. But to fit Venus in here would have changed the whole Elite Four thing that Pokemon has had going since Gen 1, before they even thought of doing all of this symbolism. Plus, Venus represents things like love, lust, passion, desire, sex, so not exactly fitting for a kid's game. But, there is another interpretation. It's a bit more of a stretch, so I'm leaving it out for now but I will explain it some other time. So make sure you subscribe so you can see when that video comes out. All right, but now back to flowers. All of these characters are named after them, but is that it? Are they just names of flowers or does it go deeper? I mean, you just bought up Iris from black and white with a flower name that fits perfectly. Are there other old flower names that work as well? Oh, yes, yes. There's this thing called the language of flowers. And basically, you can craft bouquets that say whole sentences with the right flowers. Different flowers, of course, represent different things, different words. And as I mentioned, Sun and Moon was a project Pokemon Rainbow. And Erica gives you the rainbow badge in Generation 1. And the Erica flower represents solitude, being singled out. One. Perhaps the symbolism here is coincidental. Or it's just that Gen 1 is the least involved in it all coming together because they had not thought of all this stuff way back then, so it's most likely just a coincidence. Meaning, it's its own thing. It's in solitude. Though, if all these Pokémon and characters are coming together, perhaps Red will wind up returning and being a major part in the story. But who knows, that's just speculation. Take that bit with a grain of salt. And one more fun little tangent right here, Prism Tower is the centerpiece to all of Kalos. And when you take a light and focus it, shine it through a prism, what do you get? A rainbow. Whoa. Anyway, boy oh boy does the language of flowers get involved, and as a side note, the language of flowers doesn't only include flowers, it includes all kinds of plants. Flowers are just dominant. And also, the language of flowers isn't the only thing that gives symbolic meaning to plants. Alchemy and various cultures do the same. So let's start with the obvious. Lily. White lilies represent purity, 
as well as lunar forces, the moon. Next we have Hao. Hao is the Hawaiian name for the sea hibiscus, which represents happiness. And just look at him. As well as good luck and of course, sunshine. Sun and moon. But what of Professor Kukui? To the Hawaiians, the Kukui tree represented light, which both the sun and moon give off. And the Kukui tree, of course, represents renewal. Renewal? The whole reboot theory, does it go any deeper? Oh, loads. Like with the professor in X and Y, Sycamore. To the Greeks, the Sycamore tree represented protection and regeneration. To alchemists, it is what the tree of life is, a sycamore tree. And to the Egyptians, sycamore trees lined the east gate of heaven, where the sun comes from, and is heavily associated with the night as well, especially in regards to Newt, our Lady of the Stars, who also goes by the name Lady of the Sycamore. And remember, out of all of the Egyptian gods and goddesses, which was the most prominent one in the last video? It was Newt. Meaning, if the rumors about returning to Kalos and Sun and Moon are true, then we are in for the biggest and deepest Pokemon game ever. And it already was before this. Let's go ahead and cover a few more. We know that of all the gym leaders in X and Y, Olympia seems to be the most important because of her future site and being in Anastar City, the city with the sundial. And her name is a synonym for the Hapiricum family of flowers, which to the Norse symbolizes immortality and vast knowledge. And her original Japanese name combines the pentaplets phonetica flower and the word for time. This flower symbolizes the Indian sun god. And if you watched part one, you know already that the X and Y legendaries are inspired by not only Norse, but also the Hindu gods. This flower also represents noon, when the sun is directly above. And this will become incredibly important soon. Not actually soon, in, in part three. There, there's a part three. I'll keep notes of that then. Anyway, that's the language of flowers, and most of the characters named after flowers have those flowers symbolic meaning only reflect some aspect of their personality, such as caring, excitable, determined, curious, etc. Anyway, on to another aspect. Numbers! Everyone loves numbers. Math is great. This is Generation 7. The rainbow has seven colors. Seven is also symbolic in the Bible. It is a holy number, number of perfection. In fact, I find this interesting, but in many, many various mythologies, religions, and cultures, most numbers all have the same symbolic meaning throughout, mostly. Or they're at least very similar. Chinese, Japanese, Norse, Hindu, Christian, Islam, Persian, Babylonian, Egyptian, and in most of them, seven represents a finished product, perfection, the end. In fact, the number seven is used 55 times in the book of Revelation, because that's just what Revelation is. It's the book in the Bible all about the end times. And a good number of other numbers work out symbolically too. First though, I should mention numerology. Essentially, it's the belief in the spiritual power of numbers. It's like astrology, but with math instead of stars. You'll see what I mean. The number two, of course, symbolizes dualism, opposites, yin and yang, truth and ideals, differing viewpoints. Two beckons us to choose. It urges us out of our indecision. It beckons us to make a choice and unite with like minds and like ideals. Well, that just screams the black and white games. I mean, truth versus ideals, yin versus yang. Th that was generation five, not two. Conveniently then, five, among other things, represents harmony and free will. The will to choose your own path, make a choice. Five is also man's number, separating us humans from animals and spirits. That was N's whole thing, wanting to separate humans and Pokemon. <laughs> yep, and now let's go to three. Three represents birth, maintained life, and death. The beginning, middle, and end. In numerology and alchemy, it is the base number that forms all shapes and all things. It is the number of creativity and creation, especially of the Earth. The third planet from the sun. 
convenient that the three Gen 3 legendaries were the ones who created the Earth. Yes, and so much more convenient that four represents time, space, and the universe. And in Generation 4, we got a quadrinity of Pokémon that helped shape the universe. <laughs> and now combine 3 and 4 and you get 7. Perfection! A finished product. And 7 also represents humanity's connection to its source. God. A connection to God? Azoth! But let's not stop there. Out of curiosity, and this can't possibly work, what does the number 8 represent? I mean, what if we're wrong and the 8th generation does get made? <laughs> well, I've done some thinking, and who's to say that a reboot would absolutely wipe away everything? It may just drastically change the gameplay or the story or something, make it more mature for the returning players that got rehooked thanks to Pokemon Go. So, an 8th gen may very well come out, but would be drastically different. Yes, yes, but what does 8 symbolize? 8 symbolizes Paradise Regained, Regeneration, and Resurrection. Resurrection? Death and Rebirth? 8 is also all possibilities. While 7 is infinity in our universe, 8 is the multiverse, essentially. 8 also represents circles, cycles, repetition, perhaps the resurrection of the Pokémon world. Its rebirth, 8 is just the beginning of another cycle, and the Pokémon world will continue to continue, just in a different era. Wait a minute, just back up a bit. Universal Rebirth, wasn't that the goal of Team Galactic? Ha! Yes, I was hoping you would catch on to that. So basically, every bad team, except for Team Rocket, wants to reset the Pokémon world in one way or another. All for various reasons, but their end goals are the same. But Team Galactic, the evil gang in the Generation 4 Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, want total universal rebirth. And to do that, they would need the power of at least some of the four Space God Pokémon. And what's interesting is that all of the commanders of Team Galactic are named after planets. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Cyrus gets his name from the Persian word for sun. And in most translations, his name is actually Helio, from the Greek Helios, who was the Greek personification of the sun. <laughs> Greek mythology again, the founders of various rules in Western alchemy. The Greeks just keep coming up. That they do. And here's a fun little side note. Who would you say is the opposite? of the evil team leader in Pokemon. The champion, maybe? In this case, Cynthia. And Cynthia was extremely important in Heart Gold and Soul Silver 2, the other Gen 4 game. What with all the Arceus research and such, in fact, in the anime, she appears more than any other champion ever has. She is a very, very important character, much more involved. And so would be highly involved in the Gen 4 remakes as well. And guess where the name Cynthia comes from? If all this was true with her being the opposite of Cyrus, then that would surely mean that her name would mean the opposite of Cyrus, Moon. But it can't possibly- Cynthia was the birth name of the Greek goddess Artemis. Who is the goddess of forests and hunting. Right. And the moon. No! <laughs> and her Japanese name comes from Nandina, also known as Sacred Bamboo, and it symbolizes strength and a great connection to the gods. Anyway, there is another member of Team Galactic to bring up. Chiron, or Chiron, or Chiron, however you want to say it, which is the name of Pluto's moon. Though, in some other translations, his name is just Pluto. But picking Chiron over Pluto is an interesting choice here. In Greek mythology, Pluto was the ruler of the underworld, Hades. And Chiron was the ferryman who brought the recently deceased across the rivers to the underworld. In a way, Chiron bridges the gap between dying mortals and the afterlife. The gap between our physical bodies and our spiritual souls. In Pokemon, Chiron is the scientist of Team Galactic and becomes the leader after Cyrus is defeated. He's the one behind the technology that will allow them to control the Creation Trio and Arceus, and use them to destroy the universe, essentially bringing all of those living in it 
to the afterlife. And it doesn't end there. The way Charon does this is by creating a red chain out of the jewels extracted from Uxie, Mesprit, and Azelf, which as we all know, represent emotion, knowledge, and willpower. And oh, oh so conveniently, the many rivers around the underworld were no ordinary rivers, as falling in would cause numerous effects on you, depending on which rivers you fell into. For one, there was the river Lethe. By falling in, you would forget everything about your past life, removing all knowledge. Falling into the river Acheron would put you into a constant state of sorrow, you would feel no other emotion. And falling into the river Cocceus would put you into a state of lamentation. You become devoid of willpower. Hmm. So, there are even more connections to the Greek mythologies here. Which, again, just strengthens the connection to all of this alchemy symbolism, as again, the Greeks were the founders of most Western alchemy. Plus, their alphabet contains alpha and omega, all the kinds of this stuff. And you know, come to think of it, wouldn't it be cool if the unknowns were Greek symbols? Oh, oh, they are! As we see in the Pokemon 3rd movie, there are a bunch of unknowns that appear nowhere else, and a lot of them are Greek letters, including Sigma and Omega. And speaking of the movies, the second movie has Ash, Misty, and a guy no one remembers the name of traveling the Orange Islands which you could say Alola is somewhat inspired by. I mean, look at the people here. Their culture is similar to that of many of the Polynesian islands, which Hawaii is a part of. And Hawaii is what Alola is based on. And tell me this doesn't look like Tapu Koko to you. So for one, that only strengthens the idea that Lugia will appear in Sun and Moon. And side note, the whole thing with the legendary birds is that they are a balance of fire, ice, and lightning, which just happen to be the base of offensive magics. And as we know, magic in the real world is alchemy. Speaking of the movies in the anime, what would happen to those if Pokemon were to be rebooted? We will get to that, but first let's look at the Hoopa movie. These two people are basically Arceus priests. The alpha Pokemon Arceus! Huh? Our ancestors were able to communicate with Arceus, and they received power from it too. And great-grandfather, he was able to master that power. And after the bottle that contains Hoopa is broken, they get into this circle and shoot the elements of fire, water, and earth into these symbols, where all this power is used to reform the bottle. This right here is literally alchemy. The power of Arceus is alchemy. Just like here, where Arceus itself is creating the jewel of life by combining five elements. And here, where it is creating an egg for you that will hatch into either a new Palkia, Giratina, or Dialga. It uses this transmutation circle to create matter and life from energy, from light, alchemy. Time and sky, nature, listen to my words and obey my command. I've forgotten about that, that's crazy. So wait. Azoth is the power of God, and Azoth is also alchemy, so alchemy is God's power? Perfectly spot on. And the founders of alchemy all believed that. Whew! It's as if Game Freak based their legendaries off of alchemy, and what alchemists actually believe. Oh, you have no idea. I mean, the answer is black and white. And real quick, with zero context, take a look at this image and tell me which Pokémon these look like it could have inspired. Oh no. Seriously? That's Reshiram and Zekrom fighting each other. What is this? Another alchemic drawing? Precisely. These are the two contraries, consisting of Sophic Sulfur and Sophic Mercury, two reciprocal forces of nature. They both fight, for they are opposites, yet they balance each other out. They are usually described as active and passive. This also describes the Tao's Yin Yang, which Reshiram and Zekrom are directly inspired by, as their Japanese species names are White Yang and Black Yin. And in the context of alchemy, it works out beautifully as truth and ideals are active and passive. If you are a follower of truth, what is the present reality, you are more passive. Whereas if you are a striver to achieve your ideals, make an ideological future, you are much more active in that. And considering that in alchemic drawings they are resembled by a white fluffy dragon and a black hard scaly one, you can't tell me that this wasn't taken into consideration when designing these Pokemon. Yin and Yang are symbolized by their symbol, not by animals. 
And while, of course, Game Freak takes plenty of creative liberties and tweaks things for the sake of design and functionality, it also helps to point out that Reshiram's wings are also its arms, while Zekrom has all four limbs. Just like the two contraries. The white has wings, while the black has four limbs. And plus, in alchemy, it is thanks to the two contraries that we have self-awareness, free will, and can make choices for ourselves, which was a major part of Gen 5's plot. Who'd have thunk it? But you know, where does Kyurem fit into alchemy? In the Teo Trio, Kyurem is Wuji, which is the absence of yin or yang. And looking to alchemy, Kyurem is the three essentials which is depicted as a three-headed hydra, so a single entity but with three heads, which obviously Kyurem does not have, but we'll get to that, just, just hear me out. So firstly, the two contraries and three essentials play a direct role with each other, and that role is that the three essentials came from the two contraries, Sophic Sulfur and Sophic Mercury. They work together to create the third. The third is described as the child, as the two contraries, and it is Sophic Salt. And of course, Kyurem came from the original dragon after Reshiram and Zekrom split, leaving an empty shell of Kyurem, their child. And I know that explaining this to the internet, there are going to be plenty of people saying, no, Kyurem fell from space, and those are the people that played Black and White, but not Black 2 or White 2, because Black 2 and White 2 cleared everything up. Anyway, this third essential plays a role involving the other two that fits perfectly. It freezes the two contraries and grounds them. Bruh, that's the whole point of Black and White 2. Kyurem is an ice type and Team Plasma wanted to freeze the whole Unova region. And more importantly, all of the Pokemon in the region, including Reshiram and Zekrom. And plus, doesn't that just make sense? In the Legends of the Unova region, it is stated that the battles between Reshiram and Zekrom have burned their entire region before, because they are both incredibly hot. So having ice balances them out, freezes them, and grounds them, especially since both are weak to ground type. And now, about that whole three heads thing, I think I already got it. Because Kyurem, Reshiram, and Zekrom were all once one original dragon, three creatures in one. Not necessarily one dragon with three heads, but still. Plus, I think Game Freak has us covered because there is another Gen 5 Pokemon, and it happens to be Getsis' main Pokemon. It's his Hydreigen, the three-headed Hydra dragon Pokemon. Perhaps a nod to the alchemic origin of the Tau Trio. Jeez, but still, back to before, what will happen to the anime if Pokemon gets rebooted? I believe you already know the answer to that, Toby. I mean, you did a video on it. Right, about Amor shipping, the shipping of Ash and Serena. Oh, let me summarize it for you. So once upon a time, when the show was planning to end with the first movie, there was a different Japanese trailer, which had a totally different cut of the film. The trailer, which depicted an older Misty with a small child who knew who Pikachu seems to be, suggests that Ash and Misty would, regardless of Ash's Pokemon conquests, end up together. However, the trailer is shot in a way where we don't see Ash, and it kind of implies that maybe Ash died in the first movie. However, by the time the movie came out, it was completely different, and they introduced a few Generation 2 Pokemon, was suggesting that it might have been because the creators knew they were doing a Gen 2. So they cut that conclusive bit out of the story and left it so that Ash and Misty would keep traveling together. And then in the final Johto episode, Misty says, Finally, Ash Ketchum, I know how you feel about me. Implying that just in the end, they were just really, really good friends and nothing more. Even if they had been scripted to have feelings for each other once upon a time. In the end, they're just really good friends. Now, since then, not a single character that Ash has traveled with has had that will-they-won't-they they dynamic that Ash and Misty had, and any kind of shipping is super speculative. There's just not as much there to support the shipping of characters like Iris, Dawn, and May. But then, they introduce Serena. And the writing of their relationship has been very similar to that of his and Misty's. In fact, they both met Ash in a forest outside of Pallet Town. And Serena looks like her design was inspired a lot by Leafs, who is the female counterpart to Red in Fire Red and Leaf Green. And Red is Ash's game counterpart. So it seems pretty fitting that they're connected. And all of this leads me to believe that they're finally going back to that kind of storytelling and also having Ash come very close, if not completing his dreams in the Kalos League. It's probably because they're gonna wrap things up. They're finishing his quest, they're getting rid of the story and they're going for that classic happily ever after he gets the girl kind of thing that they planned to do all those years ago. Exactly. Also, the year after Sun and Moon releases, the anime will have its 20th anniversary and eventually its 20th movie. Perhaps a good finishing point. 
Ash will likely also finally win a league altogether. He did win the Orange Islands before, but most fans say that one doesn't count for various reasons, mainly it being that it's not quite an official league. As instead of battling for gym badges, you do challenges like races and target practice. Oh, much like in Alola, there are no typical gyms, instead there are four challenges, or trials, with trial captains instead of gym leaders. Further showing that Alola is somewhat based off of the Orange Islands in the anime, and if Ash won the Orange Islands, then either he'll win in Kalos, so that Ash won't just do another Orange Islands adventure, or he'll win in Kalos and then complete his journey by completing the trials of Alola. It is pretty awesome. And back to the current anime, right now Ash's team is more powerful than it ever has been before. All fully evolved Pokemon, with the exception of his iconic Pikachu. But Pikachu has to be like level a million by now. He has two dragon types, one of them being the region's pseudo-legendary and a spirit-linked Greninja. And more. He's better than ever, and if you look at the names of the upcoming anime episodes, while these don't exactly guarantee him winning, he at least is coming in second. And with a team more powerful than ever, and with him becoming a greater and greater trainer, he most certainly will win the League or the Trials in Alola, or the anime will catch up to the games and give Ash his happy ending, both with Trial Victory and the girl. Oh, and the Norse Tree of Life, which is the home of the beings that partially inspired the X, Y, and Z legendaries, that tree is an ash tree. Just saying. So ending the anime with the title XYZ would be brilliant, especially since in Pokemon, these new Z moves are essentially the typical RPG's finisher moves, showing that yes, Z symbolizes a finisher. The end. Right, and plus it would make so much sense to reboot the anime too. Pokemon Origins did amazing because of its more mature story and tone. If they rebooted the main anime, either with a new protagonist or a much older, more mature Ash, it would definitely get all of the teens and adults who have since left and moved on more interested again. Especially thanks to Pokemon Go, it's a brilliant business move. Oh man, they're gonna make so much money. It'll be Pokemania all over again. But here's a good question. How are they gonna end the game with a universal reset? There'd be no possible post-game that would make sense. A lot of other games that have super conclusive endings like that would just put you into right before the big climactic event, for you to finish exploring the world and have fun doing side quests and such. Simple. That way you know the canon post-game ending, but can keep playing in the past before that happens. Like, like what the Infamous series does. Okay, but so no Gen 5 remakes? Or they still could, but have them be part of the rebooted gameplay and such, the new universe. Like how the Ruby and Sapphire remakes are technically part of a different universe or canon from the originals. And a reboot doesn't have to totally change everything. Interestingly, Gen 5 was already a soft reboot for the whole Pokemon franchise. The anime finally got rid of Brock, and even reset Ash's age to 10 despite the fact that he had exactly one year pass by the time of the third movie. Don't you know what today is, Pikachu? This is the day we first met. That includes the Kanto region's Pallet Town. Home to this young man, 10-year-old Ash Ketchum. Also remember that all of the staple Pokemon have been staples for until Gen 5. The Zubats, the Geodudes, the Tentacools, it wasn't until Gen 5 that they finally had all gotten replacements, and all at once. Also, you could not catch any previous generation Pokémon in black and white until you beat the game, meaning for all intents and purposes, Gen 5 was a soft reboot, and now with the Gen 4 remake being the final game according to this theory, Gen 5 will not only get to be a soft reboot, but its remake gets to be an early part of the much harder reboot. Right. Man, this is all crazy, and whether this ends up being true or not, you've made more connections within two videos than I've ever seen on YouTube. <laughs> and let me guess, you're not even done there yet, are you? Oh, not in the slightest. I mean, another possibility is that Sun and Moon is also a soft reboot in itself, but with the whole no gyms thing. But is that it? Or is it preparing us for even larger changes ahead? And get this, what if I told you that all of this, the whole reboot theory and all of Pokemon leading up to this point, fits beautifully into the Bible's telling of the end times? <laughs> 
It can't possibly. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Hmm. Lined with diamonds and pearls. Hmm. The Eclipse. Yeah. <laughs> but I will save all of that for part three. Oh, thank goodness. I need a breather. <laughs> and then this will be a trinity of videos. Uh, part of me really hopes this reboot theory is true. I also made a video in my unconsciousness about what I would want in a Pokemon reboot right here, and I'm going to start making a ton of videos about all of these points individually now, as well as using my new vast knowledge of alchemy and all this symbolism to make a few videos about Golden Sun, Final Fantasy, and Full Metal Alchemist. It's going to be awesome, so make sure you subscribe to be alerted to when those come out, and follow me on Twitter, BirdkeeperToby2, and check him out if you want a, some more Pokemon awesome stuff videos. Yeah. Um, Bloxton? Who are you talking to? Are you going crazy again? All of it. We're crashing down. No money that can buy your way out. Go ahead and try it. Cause you've had, cause you've had, cause you've had your time This has been disputed by scientists for centuries, but it does make some poetic sense. 